These are clients and they're purchasing. They got their money, they got their loan, they got their permits. They've been thinking about it for years. They want to buy. And everybody says, well, if you're good, they'll wait. They got the money. They're going to find someone else that's good that can do it now. So when I can fill the gap of, hey, you know, you got your plans and permits, everybody can start in six months. Well, I can start in six weeks or I can start in three weeks or I could put a foundation crew on an excavation crew on that next week. It's a huge selling point. I truly think that's why we get so much work. It says we're able to start it and stay on it. Welcome to episode 159 of the AFT Construction Podcast. And today we have Jamie Verdura with Verdura Construction out of Moon Bay, California. And what I love about Jamie's process is this is somebody, when I asked him about why he self performs, he's like, that's all I knew. This is what I did. And the complexity of the projects that he's doing in California, the scale of these projects, the size of crew that he has, and how he manages, you know, not only self performing, but operating as a general contractor, how that's not only helped his process, but also his bottom line. And Jamie's very open about his communication, his passion, how much he loves his people and how they feel that, that his people, his employees are his family and how that breeds through his company culture. So without further ado, let's get started. This past May, we had an amazing contractor coalition summit. This was in Nashville with Nick Schiffer from Menace Builders and Morgan Molitor from Construction of Style out of Minnesota. And we are now up for our second round of the Contractor Coalition Summit that'll be in Huntington Beach from Sunday, November 6th through Wednesday, November 9th. Go to ContractorCoalitionSummit.com, sign up, register. We have some amazing partners that'll be there sponsoring the event, amazing attendees that have already signed up. It's limited seating. We're only allowing 30 to attend. And again, this will be all things pricing, profitability, contracting, client expectations, scheduling, and of course, marketing and social media. Everything that we wish we knew in our business from the very beginning is all going to be wrapped up into just a couple of days. So we'll see you there in Huntington Beach in November. So welcome today to Construction Podcast. And we have one of my good friends, Jamie Verdura with us. Welcome, Jamie. Thanks, Brad. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Ja- Jamie goes as the boss, right? Is that, is that he, he's president, <laughs> owner, founder, you know, four different titles out there. And <laughs> that's it yeah all, all, yeah. all the good like, stuff like that he does <laughs> so i gotta ask you this so the, here's what's interesting so um you guys self-perform a lot of work jamie but i think what's interesting anytime i've corresponded with you and this is like text email or instagram like you're so quick to respond i think this is really rare because in our industry we don't see that a lot and especially with guys that sometimes have their tool bags on i mean you kind of run everything so I guess time management, maybe we'll start there. How are you so quick to respond being with so much on your plate and how much you're managing? I respond quickly because I can't let it. I don't want to come home and answer 14 emails, 10 texts and three phone calls. I just handle everything on the fly, you know, as quickly as possible. Right. I mean, if we're in the middle of something, obviously we can't answer. But uh, what's funny is um, I learned this about 10 years ago. I, I did a I did, built a house for a CEO of a bank. Right. And this is kind of before. Instagram of before, you know, the smartphones and all this. And he was the man. I mean, he was running big work, big stuff, ran the whole company, right? And he would respond instantly to everything. And I was like, man, this guy's the boss boss. And he just responds and he runs all these people and he takes care of everything. And he, and he just, he's responsive. And ever since then, I was like, man, that's how you got to be if you're a boss. And I just kind of just took that and ran with that. <laughs> You know, I love that. Hence the boss, right? That's how we started off. But you know what's interesting, Jamie? Uh, you and I see eye to eye, and maybe this banker who I've never met. What what I've found is that um, it, it really comes down so much to communication. We know that, right? I mean, there's a big difference between customer service and the customer experience. But what I've seen is that all of us get bludgeoned with, you know, uh, communication throughout the day. Emails, texts, social media, whatever it may be. But the reality is there are some, like, really important messages, maybe a client, like if a client texts me, yeah, if I'm in a meeting with another client, I'm not going to like have my phone out. Right. But there's a lot of downtime throughout the day or that I'm working on other tasks. Those messages come through. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly in front of my clients. I'm on vacation or whatever, you know, I'm, and it's just simple things. It doesn't mean like you said, I have to go home and spend three hours, but that quick communication, it just shows you there. Hey, I may not have the answer now, but I'm going to get to you shortly. That. That's right. Yeah. Respond to everybody. I tried to teach my team leaders the same thing. I was like, hey, if a text comes in, like my pet peeve is we're on a group text or a group chat and they're, they're texting the foreman or the project manager, but I'm on it too. And then my guy doesn't respond for 20 minutes. And I'll call him on the side, like, dude, why aren't you responding? And he, oh, I don't have the answer yet. I go, tell him that. 
Just say, hey, I got your text. We're checking on them. I'm calling that sub. We're checking on the material, whatever. You got to communicate. And it's a 10 second out of your day and it keeps everybody happy. No one likes to be ghosted. <laughs> so. Then the thing is, is sometimes it's th as simple as that. It's just, hey, this is received. I have an answer. Maybe I'll get on a call. I'll give an example. Yesterday, we have a group text with one of our clients. We're working in pre-con. And I won't call out one of my employees, but same thing. Like, you know, they, they had sent a group text. He and I were on it. It was addressed to him. And he didn't have the answer yet. I knew he did it. And so I don't want to step in and just like answer a form. I also don't want to step in, totally. uh, you know, because I'm kind of let, yeah, letting him run with it. So I call him and say, hey, respond right away. If you don't have the answer yet or you need to set up a call later, just do that because you and I see this. You know, that really comes down to that whole customer experience that's way bigger than yep. the customer service side. Everybody wants to know what's going on. Yeah, right. So you have all this stuff yeah. going on. You have all these projects. At, at, you know, you operate as a GC, but you also self-perform a lot of things. So what what area are you performing management and what areas are you self-performing? I didn't know that everybody didn't self-perform until I got on Instagram five years ago. I thought everybody <laughs> self-performed. <laughs> That's just how I came up, man. I started at 21 and man, I was a, you know, an apprentice carpenter and we, I worked for a GC who built custom homes and we just did everything. That's just what we did, you know? And uh, so I self-reform as much as I can. Anything carpet, I mean, foundation, framing, we excavate, um, you know, drainage siding, windows. And then I have working foreman and a lot of staff on a project, so we're able to actually manage. So while we're framing up to a roof and my plumbers are on site and they're chasing us, you know, with roughing up to the roof, well, my leads that are framing that roof can babysit that, that plumber as well. So we're kind of double dipping, if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. Now, let me ask you this. Do you find it, uh, and it's interesting because this is your upbringing, right? You grew up in the industry yep. from a young age, and this is all you've known. And California could be a little tricky. I mean, just for those who are listening, you build in Northern California. It's a great market. You know, there's a lot of wealthy clients in that area, but at the same time, there's a lot of restrictive, you know, elements to building from just a natural environment and codes. And look, I came from California. I understand what it takes to build in California. Do you find it more cumbersome because you're trying to manage now, and, and maybe I'll ask it this way, as, as we look at workers' comp and insurance rates and premiums, right? It's all adjusted depending on the tasks that you're doing. Do you find it complicated because yep. they're working in so many different aspects of the job? Yeah, yeah, running, running a, uh, we, we run 30, 30 guys in the field. So we have staff of 30 in the field and uh, payroll and comp is a, is a big deal because like you said, you know, if they're doing carpentry, it's at a 30% you know, rate or whatever. And if it's uh, foundation work, it's a 17. If it's painting, it's a 12. And, and the guys do switch back and forth. So it's a constant adjustment, you know, in the office tracking and uh, keeping track of that. You know, running payroll is a big part of the job, just managing that and, and the HR part of it. Having a lot of employees is, is tricky, definitely. So let me ask you this then. So when it comes down to your employees, are you paying them hourly or salary? I don't want to get any specifics on the exact financials of the yeah, business, no, no, right? No, but I do no want worries. to understand no, like, the overview. So everybody's hourly. It's all hourly guys. Okay. Yeah. And then and then with hourly, as you mentioned, I mean, how are you organizing? How are you organizing just the uh, whether it be time cards or their daily tasks, because as you mentioned, if you're audited, right, you have to make sure that everything's fully addressed, you know, from carpentry at 30% to concrete at 17 and painting at 12, you have to make sure that's accounted for. So how are you tracking everything? So that's it. So, so time cards, um, every employee is responsible for tracking their time. Um, and then the foremen are checking on the time cards and making sure everything jives. I'm in the field a lot. Um, People ask, I guess, how we run so many jobs. We're really lucky. We run a lot of work in a tight radius. I don't have to travel very far. Like I'm building five homes within 15 minutes. So I'm able to be on site multiple times a day, just making the rounds, driving by, checking it out. So to track the guys overall, you know, they keep track of their hours, the former are watching them. And then I got a sense of who's on the job. If I got these four guys framing, it's easy to check all their hours. I know they're all there from, you know, eight to four, whatever it is. And as long as everything's jiving and we just keep track of it and that's how we do it. Now, how do you differentiate the training aspect? Because as you look at people coming in that are hiring with the company to learn the skill sets and to be so versatile from, you know, concrete to painting to framing. I mean, these are not, you know, things that just carry over from one to another, you know. 
No, they they don't. Um, but for instance, for for painting, I have a painting division. I run six full time painters, um, and that and all they do is paint. If for some reason we're a little slow, as you know, you know, turnkey in a custom home, there's a lot of cleaning and dusting and covering and protecting. So those painters will come in and help us with stuff like that. Um, but as far as the carpentry work, you know, running forms, tying rebar, and actually rough framing, to me, is all kind of the same trade. Um, and, you know, guys start as laborers, guys come in as, you know, carpenters already experienced, and they kind of just get in where they fit, and we just run with the crew. There's no real set training, because everybody comes in at different skill levels, you know. You got a guy who comes in at 20, knows nothing. You got a guy who's, you know, 40, who's a journeyman, who might jump in with us. So, you know, I have... Like with 30 guys, I got guys have been with me for some of them 15 years. So my leads are very capable and versatile and can run crews and bring up pretty much anybody at any level. And they can fall in with us and, you know, just do what they're capable of and start learning on the, on the job, basically, hands on training. So what's interesting about you, Jamie, and, and, and I've met you personally, you've been here to Phoenix. We've been, we, you know, we've seen each other at the Builder Shows. You have this like very charismatic like personality, so that draws people. My question for you is though, how how do you build a culture in your company where you've had employees for fifteen years that have never left, and you know they can continue to get better and more experienced and understand your thought process and your system, but how do you retain you know good people? It's uh well I mean there's there's two things. One you got to pay them, all right. You gotta you gotta be competitive. You know, you got to understand what what your competitors are paying their guys, right? And number two, it's just you got to, I mean, for lack of a better term, you got to be cool. I mean, you got to understand these guys turn into family. I mean, they, they, they really, you really need to treat people right, like how you want to be treated. It's actually, I mean, it's easy to have a bad day and we're stressed out. As you know, we get stressed out, right? And to take it out on your guys or your wife or your kids. Now, everybody's guilty of that, I'm sure, once in a while. But, you know, locking that up and just being under control and being a good, you know, good leader and again, a good person. And sometimes you go friend and we're a lot of hats managing people. I mean, it's pretty much probably the hardest thing in the trades is, is all the people, you know, and having a lot of them on your own staff is just another element, another layer to the onion. Does it ever um, give you a point of pause? And what I mean by that is that, you know, I speak to a lot of people on the podcast and network with a lot of people and there's always this, you know, this conservative effort in the sense that as a business owner, if you're a sole proprietor, a single person, for lack of a better word, you may have more complication on having to self-perform and do everything, but you don't have to manage people, right? But when you have a company of 30 and as the company grows, it's more people, it becomes more people management than maybe the business side. Um, to an extent, right? I think as you're mentioning, it all depends on company culture and systems and the relationship and how you delegate. Um, do you ever have any concern saying I'm responsible for 30 people like how am I managing them how do we keep it that the HR is always good it's always clean we don't have any issues right between everybody yeah that's a constant that's a constant thing I, mean, I didn't sleep for probably five years of my career you know as you get older a little more used to it you definitely you <laughs> definitely uh you're able to you're able to get through it but no it's a constant it's a constant thing um and it's and it's funny because you can see it happen in, in the culture of the company on you know weekly or even like monthly maybe. If I lose a little uh, a little touch with the guys and we're not communicating or I'm not having some meetings or just just checking in with people, you can see the company the morale go down. So it's a big thing having a lot of energy and you know being you know a cheerleader for the crews is a big deal when you're running that many people. I love that you share that. I think this is unique in construction because in my experience, and I, I, I can say this as when I was an employee before I started my company, I could see it now being the owner, is that as we go out there, you know, a lot of times we kick off our team, you know, in these construction projects could be a year, they could be two years. I mean, these are long projects that are out on their own. They may not be having lunches with the company. So you kind of get put on this island. And if you can find ways to engage with them, right, as you mentioned, Jamie, to come in and, and for lack of a better word, just be a cheerleader, come in and have that energy. Hey, guys, what can I help you with? How, how are things going? And it's almost this energy boost. I know one of my coordinators said, um, and it, it, it's not anything special maybe you are doing, but I know that we had a project that they're remote and she's like, Brad, when you come out, just like this, like re new energy comes out because like you're like, well, let's get this done. Let's get this done. Let's make this call. Let's. You know, you, they, they kind of get the backing and support that maybe they otherwise wouldn't have. Totally, totally. Being, being, a, being a boss and a leader, and as you know, is, is you, we carry a lot of gravity. 
I know it, for me, if I'm down or I'm beat up or I'm tired or I'm preoccupied with other stuff, the, the morale, the whole energy of the company shrinks. And, and it, it's, you know, and it's hard being that person sometimes. Talk about being on an island. I mean, you know, when you are the contractor and you are the boss <laughs> and everybody's, you know, well, and everybody's got a question, that phone, you're, you're the buck stops here, right? That, that phone's ringing. You're the guy that answers it. And, you know, sometimes you can reach out to some other buddies or some other peers, but a lot of the times you've got to figure stuff out on your own. But if I find if I let it get to me and I start projecting any kind of negativity, production, morale, everything in the company tanks quickly. So it's it's a big deal staying positive, being that guy, big smile, say, how you doing, slaps on the back. And that keeps the, I mean, that's really motivating for the guys. I mean, I mean it's anybody. Everybody wants to be around positive people. It, it's hard to do that, too. I mean, to that point, Jamie, as you think about it, it you know, if, if you're the leader and the boss of the company or the owner, right, and you have a tendency to maybe badmouth one of your trade partners or one of your clients, you know, that culture, that toxicity is going to kind of bleed through everybody at the company. It, do you have any, like, recommendations or, you know, kind of your key to success to stay positive? Because here's the, here's the bottom line is as an entrepreneur and the owner – like you're dealing, the buck stops with you, as you said, like you're dealing with all the issues. Typically when your phone rings, it's not like, Hey, Jamie, how's it's going? It's here's this problem. <laughs> yeah. We haven't been paid. Yep. We got to get this done. There's an accident on the job. I mean, whatever, like you're dealing with crap all day. Yeah, so yeah. like, how do you keep all your day. mental like aptitude high? I mean, that's, that's a good, great question. I, I honestly, that's probably my personal biggest struggle is um, just trying to get a balance, you know, between being, Super busy leader, contractor, husband, father, um, you know, all those things. And then trying to stay motivated. And to be honest with you, I, I struggle with it. It's hard. Um, constantly um, self-evaluating, constantly reinventing. And I'm talking like not every New Year's. I'm talking weekly, <laughs> you know. So it's, um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's hard. It's, it's a struggle. I mean, as much, I mean, from diet, diet to uh, exercise to, you know, better sleep to, you know, Better jobs, um, better coach. I mean, there's so many factors to stay to staying positive that it's a, it's a constant struggle for me. I mean, I don't know, but it's uh, it's hard to stay up all the time. Do you feel that it's been more challenging lately in these last couple of years, like due to COVID and due to like supply chain and labor issues? So the whole yeah, I mean, it was it was it was hard. Um, I mean, I hate to say this because I don't really like it is what it is attitude um but some of the things like you know like a, like a window being out you know 27 weeks you know that's terrible and it's it's but it's out of our control and i mean to be honest with you it kind of does it actually helps us because i'm able to do you know as a self performer it's just we go foundation frame another house by that one sitting for waiting for windows and you know it's just it just roll with the punches i mean that's something that i learned a long time ago in construction is this the day to day, and I hate to be reactive. We really try to be proactive, but let's face it, things happen every single day where we got to react. And it's just like COVID in the last two years, we're just reacting to it and getting through it. So going back to the self perform, I mean, you mentioned you know you're doing excavation, concrete, painting, so many different aspects. Uh, is, is, is that something you continue to like increase scopes of work? Are you trying to decrease? I mean, where have you found the happy medium to, Hey, this is what is in our wheelhouse we're going to do. And this is what we're going to outsource. Um, I will continue to grow as long as I get the contracts. So if I land three more new custom homes next year and they're big, I'll keep increasing framers, you know, operators, whatever I need to get it done. Um, if I get buried and I can't fill that gap with my own staff, I'll sub it out. I have that capability. I can call a framer. I can call another excavator to bail me out. So uh, I just like to do as much in-house as I can. Just basically, if somebody can do that job and make money at it and, and have a business like an excavator or a framer, I want to do it. Because I still get paid my management fee. I still do my 20% markup on top of those line items. But I'm, I'm bidding everything market value. The framing's at, I don't know what it is, you know, 20 bucks a foot, whatever. They're making, hopefully they're making four bucks, five bucks a foot profit when I want that. So um, I'll increase staff as I increase projects. And right now, the knock on wood, the market's been great. And we've, I mean, we just, for whatever reason, the last year and a half, two years, we've just started getting in 
to a wheelhouse of just nice, big, high-end custom homes. And um, we're good all the way through next year with more work than we can pretty much handle. So we're staffed up and I'm always looking for guys. This is where we are right now in the market. Yeah. And as you speak about this, what's interesting is you could kind of play a sales pitch either way, you know, like the GC that's just a true management can play the sales pitch. Hey, you know, I have uh, at my disposal plenty of, you know, framers or electricians. Right. But at the same time, someone such as you, Jamie, could play their other card and say, well, by getting me, I'm not waiting on a subcontractor. Right. I'm managing this. I have the people. We're going to go in and knock this out. Have you ever had clients yep. push back that you're still performing certain scopes? Uh, as, as long as you can get it done, because the, the, I ran into it a few years ago when we weren't big enough, where you're self-performing, but you don't have enough bodies to self-perform trades that are going concurrently, right? So if you could be excavating, doing drainage over here, and you could be framing, but you only have six guys, well, one of those are, are failing. So now you're not efficient. But if you have enough guys and you can do like today, we're doing framing, we're doing foundation work and we're doing drainage on the job. I got enough bodies there and they're crushing it. And we're going faster than anybody else could because you couldn't lock that sub in that quickly to get them out here as the job's changing. Um, it's a huge selling point for me. Like I push that, that's my number one thing I push. I get, I feel like that we get so much work because these are clients and they're purchasing. They got their money. They got their loan. They got their permits. They've been thinking about it for years. They want to buy. And everybody says, well, if you're good, they'll wait. They got the money. They're going to find someone else that's good that can do it now. So when I can fill the gap of, hey, you know, you got your plans and permits. Everybody can start in six months. Well, I can start in six weeks or I can start in three weeks or I could put a foundation crew, an excavation crew on that next week. It's a huge selling point. I truly think that's why we get so much work. It says we're able to start it and stay on it yeah there's no doubt i mean that backlog and lead type would play a huge role with any client making that decision do they ever uh you know in regard to pricing have you ever had the conversation where they're like hey jamie if you're self-performing how do i know that i'm getting market rate right how do i know that i'm paying not a premium to for you to self-perform all the all the time i mean everybody everybody wants to i'm building some big stuff for some developers and that's a big question for them well hey you're still performing you're doing so much why'd your management be so high blah 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 i said hey constant sale i mean <laughs> this, this is the market value it's the market value go call this guy he's going to charge you 20 percent plus his management then he's going to call me to come frame it at this foot price and you're just going to pay him to babysit why not pay me i'm the better builder i'm here all day i got total control right and I can control change orders and that and those costs and I can and I can speed things along. It's not like, hey, we want to move this window. All right, no problem. Framers here, we do it. It's my guys. You pay that guy 40 bucks an hour, cost us 80 bucks. There's no sixteen hundred dollar change order and two weeks of back and forth and all these things. I'm able I'm able to operate quickly and effectively and control cost, which makes to me makes us valuable. And I just tell them that up front. You know, you're gonna pay the same at the end of the day. We're just gonna do it cleaner faster. So that's the sale. Well, it's interesting. And you, yeah. And you mentioned this earlier, Jamie, I mean, this all comes back to networking. I know you're big networking. I mean, you're connected to so many of us around the country and even locally. And you mentioned this with employees that you have to understand what's the pulse, what's the, what's the current rate going on in the market so that I can keep my people. But additionally, what's the current rate that they're charging their customers so that I know that I'm competitive. So how often does that networking and just getting a pulse of where you're at financially bidding jobs, employees what you're paying them just to know that you're you know in the right playground if you will that's a constant thing especially in this environment with inflation happening and, and, and guys are struggling you know with uh you know rent and gas and uh, california is brutal um just it's a constant instagram's a big one talking to guys but it, that's a little tricky though because everybody's market's different um but just talking to local contractors being yeah. that guy it's a little harder to talk locally um with guys because we are competing but I'm at a point right now where I'm open. I'm an open book. I talk about pretty much what I pay my guys, what I charge. If you want to charge less than me, go ahead. I'm still going to go try to sell. I won't get them all, but I don't really even mind giving some of that inside information at this point. I think, I think this is the market's the market. And then people, how much do you charge? I goes as, as much as they'll give me. I mean, it's all, it's a constant, it's constantly changing. You know? <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, I, well, I've seen that too. I mean, just in our market, I've seen where some of my trade partners, you know, they, for lack of a better word, some of them that are great guys, they just kind of became 
complacent, if you will, right? And they were open with me. They're like, Brad, I became complacent. I didn't really see what the market was doing, what people were being paid. And they started losing like key people that have been with them, you know, because they're going to get paid more. And so it's really important that we understand where's the market going? What is the current market? What we're charging? Are we losing people? And, you know, because labor is everything for us. Labor is, labor is everything. This is a this is a business of bodies. I mean, you need people to get this done. At the end of the day, we get paid to nail stuff up. you got to build something to collect your checks. Um, but for me, keeping in touch with the guys is a big one. And just having an open door, whether it's an open office door, an open truck door, or, or an on-telephone. If somebody gets offered a job or they're unhappy, you can tell when guys are unhappy. you, you got to go talk to your guys, but you can tell when people are upset. It's not that hard. Or they're having a hard time at home, whatever. But if somebody gets a job offer... Unless they hate the environment, they hate working for you. At the end of the day, it's all the same. They're going to go bang nails here or they're going to go bang nails there. But you say, hey, I'm getting a job offer for five more dollars an hour. And then me, I'd say, oh, really? Well, what are they going to do? How far are you going to drive? You know, where are they working? What kind of jobs do they do? Let's check this company out. Maybe you need to give that guy a $5 raise. Maybe he deserves it. You know, there's a lot of things there. But for me, just keeping an open door and an open mind and talking to everybody, you know, I want the first right of refusal. If you're getting, if you're getting the raise and offer, I'd like to counter it, you know, and, and at least to help you explain what they're offering, <laughs> you know, so kind of how I play it. But yeah, definitely that's a con it's constantly a thing. Having a lot of guys, there's always talk to money for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that gets around to you pretty quickly having 30 employees, you know, that are paid hourly there. So getting back to the project size, do you, are you doing remodels and new builds still? Are you doing both? And what is kind of the size difference, you know, up to the biggest size project you're working on? Uh, the biggest contract right now we have, we're building a custom home. Um, it's uh, 7,500 square feet on the water. Um, real nice high-end stuff. Um, and then we go all the way down. We're doing a bathroom remodel right now, um, which is more of a management thing. That's more to sub-management. We don't need a bunch of framers inside a bathroom. Um, and those ten, those at this point right now, we're probably going to be phasing out of those because they just take too much time. They're just not worth it for us, for a project manager to go deal with tile layout and have a cranky client because we didn't clean something up that day. It's just not worth it. Um, but um, we tend to focus on new, on new construction. Um, we're doing, I don't know, five, five or six new custom homes. Um, some are being turnkeyed, some are in framing, and then we have two empty lots that we just staked out. We're going to be grading here pretty quick. Um, but yeah, we'll do remodels. We'll do, I mean, we'll do anything residential, really. I mean, if it, if it makes sense and the budget's right and it's something we can make some money at, we'll, I'm definitely looking at it. This episode is brought to you by Pella Windows. When it comes to building homes at AFT, almost every project has Pella Windows. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to, to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. They're, their company culture, their integrity, their honesty you know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. And if you want to learn more about Pella Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. For those of you that have listened to the podcast, you know how big of a fan we are of Build a Trend and that we have used this software for the last four years. And many of the guests that we brought on the podcast are also Build a Trend users. And in this day and age, with as busy as all of us are in construction, as complicated as it is with escalation pricing, lead times, tracking, organization, all of us need a good project management software to help simplify and organize our business. And there are a couple features that we love a ton about Build-A-Trend. And one is the owner portal. The other is the daily logs. And these are features that we use daily, right? Half of my clients are out of state. And as an owner, 
it is so imperative how we communicate with our clients, with our team, with our customers. And through Build a Trend, this allows us that quick connection. They can check at any time. We can communicate with them. We're up to date. This has actually helped us win jobs, win projects because of that organization, especially at pre construction. And Build a Trend also offers a ton of service on the back end, training and understanding and workshops, you know, to help us use our software effectively. They also have the podcast, The Building Code. To learn more, head to buildertrend.com backslash AFT to get a 60 day money back guarantee on your Builder Trend account. That's 60 days to make sure you love this product with no pressure, and I know you will. And how do you manage just the organization because you're working on projects with so much versatility, you know, from the bathroom to a new custom house, you're self performing, you know, are you using software? How are you tracking just the management side? Yeah, so I'm a little, I'm a little old school. Um, I just kill them with energy. Um, I have, I mean, I have working foremen. I have foremen that are out handling stuff. So, you know, I say, oh, yeah, I'm responsive on my phone and this and that. I don't really get a lot of calls on day to day. Like if that, if that bathroom's dirty, they don't tend to call me. They'll call my lead and he'll just, he'll take care of it. And he'll send the laborers over. But um, I got guys in the field. You know, if, if we go and we're doing a foundation, we go and we lay it out. We get the surveyors out. We get the guys going. And then my, my leads are running that foundation for six weeks, you know? And then I'm out in the field a lot. I'm not an office guy. You see this over here? I'm not allowed in this office. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm more I'm more of a field guy. So I'm I'm on all the job sites every day. I'm not on every job every day, but I'm in the field a lot and put my eyes on a lot of things. And um it's just I don't know. We just that's what we do. It's I don't really run a lot of software. You how do you guys are running a lot of software? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, from our side, what I've seen is, um, so bluebeam has been a big thing. I've spoken to a few contractors. So I, uh, Spencer, who's my director of operations now, he, his background, he and I have, we're actually in college together. We worked together out of college and then we kind of went, um, in 2010 ish, 11, he went to go do structural steel, like heavy, you know, commercial structural steel for, um, and then I was, you know, started AFT. So when I brought him back, he had this seven, eight years where he was doing in commercial steel and he had worked with these really um, large commercial general contractors all around the country. He's doing stuff in California, not too far from you, Jamie, and, you know, in the Southwest. And anyways, they, they were really big on like pool plan scheduling. They were big on Bluebeam. And so bringing him on, this really helped us because Bluebeam, that software now really helps us like all of our punch lists are run through Bluebeam and, you know, we have trainings. And so... That's been helpful for us. I don't know if you're using any, like we use build a trend as well, which is projects management software, but um, how are you guys tracking like punch list and you know scheduling and all that stuff? So, yeah, I mean, we control a lot of schedule in house, right? So that's really helpful to have that capability. Um, I don't need to line up the framing crew from, you know, I don't need to line the sub up and a lot of the, you know, right. siding, interior trim, all paint, it's all, all me. So I only need to lock in my mechanicals and my tile, basically, and everything else is is in house and under control. So we can move guys around and we can gauge it on the week. You know, how how are we doing? Up, oh, another another week on the roof. Okay, no problem. Get the guys there. Um, but it's it, it, what it is really. Um, and we did a little bit of procure stuff like that. I just I'm not computer savvy. I mean, I'm gonna be honest here, but I I am a big on communication. I'm talking. I'm probably annoying to my to my leads, because, but we talk constantly i'm in constant communication and it might be you know one of the reasons we do get a little stressed out because we're not relying on, on a computer program to kind of check in and check check off checklists and things like that and things do get missed i mean to be honest here but um just a constant state of checking in and how we doing and where, where are we at how are the guys doing what the inspectors say what's the next phase where are we at with materials you know it's just a constant just constantly managing just have a lot of people in the field but it's you know, you say you're running like 12, right? We've talked a little bit before. You guys are going to take them down to the builder show. Um, 12. So you have 12, yeah. you know, manager or staff in the office. So I have 30 guys in the field, but that's, they're not all managers, but I have control. If I have 30 guys and I have, you know, six jobs going, and I have five man crews on all these jobs. I have control, some kind of control on every job. It's a phone call. Hey, is the sub there? What's he doing? What's he saying? How's the tile looking? I can call any one of my jobs and check in and get a snapshot or a picture or, or understand what's going on, who's there, who's not there. It's a phone call away because essentially I have five, you know, I have 10 eyeballs on six projects that, I, that are mine. 
So it's, that's, that's another way that we're able to do things by self-performing. We have control of it. I have bodies on every site all the time. So that, that, that's helpful. Well, and I think what's unique for you, Jamie, as you mentioned, I mean, because we, we really have to be vigilant about our scheduling because, again, I'm, re- I'm, I'm the like, complete opposite of you, right? I'm relying on all my trade partners to get out there and perform, whereas you have the full control of that. You can send your framer, you can send your plumber like to where they need to be, and you actually control that, whereas I don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that, that control, is, it's, it's really helpful. And it's probably a reason why we're able to do it without running a lot of computer software and things like that. Um, just having the control and be able to push guys wherever you can and really gauge the speed and understanding the speed of the guys. Like if I'm the framing contractor, I know how fast we're, hey, we're gonna go you know, do a roof there off and frame this roof for this customer or whatever. I just know that's gonna take us six days. And if it ends up taking us five, I have another job to slide my guys right into. You know, and if they're a day behind, it's okay, but I can peel off some guys and put more bodies on it and then move my guys around. So it's basically a game of chess every morning. It's like an NFL draft, and that's actually happens. It happens a lot because your 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 foremen <laughs> are constantly they're constantly asking for different guys, right? Because some guys are better at other things. So that that's one of the things we have to negotiate throughout the company is what guys go where. That's a that's a big one. But having control is huge. So it's so what have you ever thought because you mentioned that you subcontract out the mechanicals and tile and i'm sure there's mm-hmm. maybe a couple other scopes have you ever given thought yeah. to like start those companies and sub perform that as well uh every day every day that's 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 how i started self-performing as i was coming up and i was subbing things out like excavation i would get cranky with somebody who didn't show up or a huge what i thought at the time you know it's 28 an unfair change order um something like that I just got pissed off and went and bought machines. That that's <laughs> that's how the company starts. And the more and more, I mean, to be honest with you, like sheetrock, sheetrock's always been hard for me to execute because I'm paying my guys carpenter wages. But as the prices are rising right now, and, and, and it's starting to get to a point where if I can start doing it in house and make money, I will. Right? If I can sub it out because I can't make a dollar out of it, I'll just sub it out, and manage it, and then do you know do your you know, standard contractor markup. But if I could do all that and do it in house and make another 10% or 20% on it. It's definitely on the table for me. That that's every trade is up for grabs for me if I could figure it out. So as, as you're looking at starting new trades and you've done this in the past and we touched on this very briefly, but the training side is you're bringing them up, you know, because anyone that follows you and I know you're going to give your social media handles, you guys are doing some like super complex projects. As you mentioned, some of these high end homes you're doing, in the Bay Area, you know, Northern California, these are not, and you're doing with seismic stuff, you know, and you have, yeah. you know, different weather yeah. things and just regulations for California. Training side, reading plans, understanding, you know, the new codes and stuff, and just training the younger generation that's coming and working for your company. Um, you know, yeah. how are you running them through that cycle? So that's 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 a tough one. So that's where I'm involved. So the the, the big front end work, um, and I, listen, I got I got leads, I got guys that are very good that you know that are running the jobs, but I'm very involved on that front end stuff. Big foundation, big steel moment frame work, uh, big framing. I'm involved. I'm there in the mornings. We're looking at plans. I'm doing takeoffs. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at materials. Um, I'm ordering steel. Like we do the steel, the big, I mean, we just did half a million dollars in moment frames on the job and I'm not doing the actual oh, welds, wow. but I hire, I, the, I hire the welder and he works for me. But I order the steel. I give them the elevations. I'm out there. We're doing it, but I'm doing it in house as a vertical construction. We're we're the contractor doing the steel work, and that's how we do it. I mean, I'm I'm very much involved, and I'm and I'm a framer by trade. I started just I started as a as a carpenter when I was 20, and just been building. You know, back then two three homes a year. Up into the last couple of years, where we're building five and six, and just been on all of them. And you know, and then I got guys that have been with me 10 or 15 years, so they are very versed. They understand how to do hold downs and rebars and stirrups and bracing and framing and cutting roofs, and that's what we do. It's California, and that's how we do it. But I'm very much involved. Now, I'm not bags on climbing up in the roof rafters, but I'm on site looking at plans and checking layouts and doing all that. So going back to the steel side, this is interesting because we, similar to you, I mean, a lot of our homes have structural steel. And of course, you know that mm-hmm. truth be told, for those that may not know, we started our own structural steel company. So um, I'm not self-performing really anything with the exception of structural steel. How, how did you contact, you know, to have, you know, the, the shop drawings completed, you know, ordering the steel and then now bring on a welder so that you're self-performing that? 
So the, so the welder I've just known since we were both kids, both we were both 25, right? Coming up in the trades from a long time ago. And he was doing some of my smaller stuff back then as he's grown. Um, so he's, he's you know, licensed and all his, all his uh, certs are up to par. And he'll come in and run welding for me by the hour. Or he'll give me a price on some stuff, right? But, it's, but all the ordering, I order it all. Shop drawings, we'll find, you know, I sub that out to different basically architect guys who do the shop drawings we'll stuff that out hey how much to do the shop drawings for the shop about ah, 1500 bucks cool do it um but i'll still go out there because i mean to me steel is still framing so i still look at it like framing i can't cut in and weld it because i'm a wood guy but i still lay it out that way right elevation is this this is the, you know this is the, the welds you can learn that and then you know all that good stuff but i just bring them in and that's just how we do it you know and i understand a lot about steel i order a lot of steel man <laughs> As you know, you see the numbers, right? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of steel these days, and I'm sure you guys are starting to see it in Arizona now, too. And we're starting to see everything residential has some sort of steel frame in it in California now. Whether it be a beam or a frame or whatever, all the way up to massive structural steel. And, and do you find that because uh, it's more associated with the architectural design, if you will, you know, big multi sliders, you know, bigger yeah. openings, bigger great rooms, entertaining areas. Is it driven more by that or is it more of a code thing? Uh, it's driven by that. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, big, huge loads, basically in California, every, every, I mean, it's the same with you guys, everyone wants to do big open floor plan. So that means a lot of, you know, a lot of open space, not a lot of walls. California needs a lot of shear, right? A lot of plywood, hold downs, things like that. Well, if you don't have a lot of walls, there's not a lot of shear. So now you have to do it out of structural steel. Uh, big cantilevers. We're doing a lot of like we're doing a home right now where two corners of the building, two stories are all corner post or corner glass, no post, stacked, <laughs> two stories high. So you can imagine the steel to make that work, yeah. the cantilever, and then maintain the shear. In the middle of that, we have an 18 foot multi slide. So there's no shear on the building. So the whole thing's steel. But then they started, and now what they're doing is they're incorporating it. And it's actually now it's more of an architectural detail. So now we have floating staircases, metal catwalks. So they, it's it's a modern you know board form structural steel home so it's just i mean they're big big dollars and big deals and yeah it's uh, structural steel is a good business to get into man congratulations <laughs> <laughs> well i i actually like it i mean it's interesting we do a lot of commercial too we've done some schools and we do yep. we, we've done quite a few commercial projects already and we're still performing you know our residential and a couple of our peers were doing theirs but um but to your point, you know, the architectural details now, exposed steel, even in transitional designs and modern designs is very common. And then, you know, for the deflection on these big, we have the same thing. We have microbursts, so we're doing with a lot of shear. And so the structural steel is just a way to kind yeah. of, you know, come up with these amazing designs and still protect it from, you know, all the, the code regulation, but then give these multi-sliders that seem to be a big player for all of our clients. Oh, well, yeah, I learned deflection the hard way. Well, we, uh, we did a, uh, that was like five years ago, big multi-slide, and we're doing, I mean, I think it was like a, a 1687 or something, you know, big heavy steel, right? And it was running 40 feet, but that, even under its own weight, it would deflect an inch and a half, right? So you had to get it in, load it up with the roof, and then frame underneath it nice and level, because your multi-slide has to be perfect, or that doesn't work. So, yeah, there's definitely some learning curve to uh, dealing with all these big steel and all this big custom um uh, details that these homeowners are asking for these days there's a lot to it yeah and i think most people don't realize how much there is to it and that's where someone experienced like you jamie can look at a set of plans and and really guide the client right through this whole process because there's so much more to building than just hey i'm calling so and so i got a cheap price show up to the job you know i tell my clients that you know, when you're pricing, this is always a sensitive thing. Well, I know so-and-so or, you know, I can get this bid and they're less. And I'm like, well, getting a cheap price, that's like 5%. The 95% is actually understanding what has to be installed and performing and showing up when I call them and warranting the project, right? And there's so much more to that educational process for clients and the technical side. I mean, th there's so much technical construction knowledge that you have, Jamie, doing a hillside build as opposed to just calling someone and sending them out there, you know? Yep. No, that and, that and again, that goes back to the to the initial sales, the initial meet and greet um, is just basically explaining to people, you know, what we do and what we have a grip on. Right. So if you're if you're a foundation framer and the builder, 
you know, my biggest selling point is I control your whole building. And of course, I'm going to put the foundation in, right? Because I don't want to frame on top of something that's wrong. And of course, I'm going to put the structural steel in, right? Because I'm going to be setting your doors. I don't want those to be wrong. And everything's in-house and controlled. And after you've done it a couple of times, you really have a good grip on it. And homeowner, people know if you know what you're talking about or not real quick. Because let's face it, the clients that are hiring us are all highly educated, highly intelligent, heavy hitters. So you can't, I tell my guys, if you don't know, don't lie. Just tell them you don't know because they'll see right through your BS in a heartbeat. They are smarter than us. <laughs> so, but yeah, go back to it. It's a big selling point. <laughs> well, well here's, here's what's interesting. Jamie, it's not just that uh, that you may be working for some really savvy clients. The industry today is so much different because they can go on YouTube now and they can go on social media and they can see like different products and correct installation practices. And I, I mean, we've had clients that are super savvy when it comes to like building science, like certain things that they want. And they've learned this from watching even our friend Mar Matt Reisinger, right? Like watching Reisinger videos. Yep. I mean, there's so much content that we have to really have our ducks in a row. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point, and that and that's really true. I mean, sometimes it's to their detriment. It's um, you know, they 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 know enough to get everybody in trouble, but it's like I tell, like I just said, I just tell yeah. the guys, I I tell the guys, just be honest. If you don't know something, I tell people all the time. Listen, I'm a I'm a very experienced builder. If I don't know something, I tell a client straight up, I don't know, I'll check, even if it's embarrassing, because you know what? It's just better to be honest. And there's so much information out there at everybody's fingertips. It's just, it's, it's actually kind of crazy. It's, it's a little different. I wish I had it when I was growing, when I was coming up in the trades, uh, the amount of information that, I, that everybody can you know, learn in any industry, in any trade, it's, it's just phenomenal. It's pretty amazing what, you know, the resources that are out there now. So go back to just the operational side. You mentioned, you know, you, you don't get to spend much time in the office except for the podcast we're doing here. So who's running That's your right back in all your office? So back end is the boss lady. So I am running the company. My partner uh, is my wife. So this is this is her office. Right? So she's the one who's in charge of payroll. Um, she's doing, I'll do estimating. But again, like I'm not computer savvy. So I still handwrite things out. I still have my list. I still do takeoffs with pen and paper, pencil. I look at everything, write it down. It goes to her, it gets typed up, kicks back to me. I verify. Um, I'll spend an hour in the morning, get it all up, get it to her. She'll kick it back to me while I'm in the field. I'll do stuff on the fly while I'm out. And um, yeah, I, did, I run a lot through the phone. Um, but yeah, Michelle does a lot, right? So payroll, tracking, taxes, you know, we have bookkeepers, we have a CPA, um, but Michelle's running, running the office for sure. Well, you guys have an amazing relationship. What, what's the secret to working together and being married? <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so that's a whole nother podcast, Brad. <laughs> so so yeah, that, that's something that took, a, it's, that's still, that's a work in progress. It's, uh, it's very hard. Talk about work-life balance. <laughs> um, you know, you, you imagine getting in a fight with something to do at home and then having to wake up in the morning or... 10 minutes later, it's business, right? Because you're still partners and you're still talking about something. It's uh, That's real tricky. And for me, this, I mean, I, like, as you know, like high energy, I'm a pusher. Nothing's fast enough for me. I want to go, 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 go. So I've been having to slow down a little bit and lay off everybody, um, especially my wife. <laughs> so that's definitely true. That's not for everybody. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I'm always amazed at that because when I talk to like Ashley, sometimes I'll like lean on her and stuff and she's like, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm just like, you know, it's always a tough balance, right? As you're trying to figure out just the relationship side and then the business side and, you know, we all have our own strengths and, you know, sometimes, you know, those yep. will we'll crash at times, right? I think most of us can relate to that. Yeah, totally. That's funny. It is, yeah. So, what about kids? Do you know uh, kids? Are they going to get involved in the business at some point? Oh, uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, I'm not a big, um, you know, keep craft alive. You got to swing a hammer. Um, and I just learned that after my first one and my second <laughs> and third came along, I realized how different they all are. Um, I didn't really understand that being a new dad, but now being an old dad, I totally get how different they are, and they're going to do. They're going to do them. It's definitely an option. Um, and having built the company that we built, 
they can be carpenters or they can be PMs or they can do taxes or they can, I mean, there's the sky's the limit in, in a construction company. As you know, there's so much to do. They could be designers. They can go to school and become architects. They can, there's so much to do. So all doors are open for them. Um, but no, they're not, we're, I'm not beating them down and making them come and, and pump lumber for me on Sundays just to teach them a lesson. You know, they're kids and they're young and they're going to do them and I support whatever direction they go. Uh, I can relate. Having six kids, I know they're all completely different. And most of mine are daughters. And I have one that's interested in architecture. We'll see where she ends up going. But, um, you know, it's interesting just to see each of them kind of pursue their own personalities and like what what attracts them right to their future potential career. Yeah, no, it's 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 a neat thing. It's um, yeah, I learned a lot having kids. It definitely, definitely teaches you a lot about life. That's for sure. Oh yeah, no, you're saying you're six kids. So you have in your all there are five daughters and one son. Yeah, five daughters and one son. Yeah. So my oldest daughter is uh she's a freshman in college. And then um I have one that's a junior in high school, one that's in eighth grade that'll be a freshman next year, and then one in third grade, first grade, and kindergarten. So they're all in school now, which is which is pretty nice. That's a yeah, that's a that's a big thing to get them all out of the house for sure. Oh, that's cool, man. Yes. And, and, and again, I think my second one, she, my junior in high school, she's a little bit more attracted to like going to architecture. That's kind of her goal right now. We'll see how that goes. Um, you know, but getting back to like the business side, I saw that you had sponsored Bellator, you know, one of the fires in Bellator. How did that come up? You know, how did that even yeah. become a possibility for you? Yes. Yeah. Well, he's, um, he's, he's our, he's our hometown fighter, man. He's uh he fights out of half moon Bay, California. So it's uh that's pretty neat. And then I'm a big, I'm a big sponsor to anybody locally. Um, and that's probably some advice to maybe some of the younger guys, maybe starting out or listening to this. Um, that's helped a lot, you know, um, just getting your name out there is, I mean, I'm talking sponsor T-ball, little league soccer, uh, the local Bellator fighter. I mean, anybody locally, if Rodeur construction has a name on them, I, I mean, and it's, it's great for business, but I actually like it. It's fun. You know, it's, 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 it's neat having your name on the, on the Bellator fighter shorts and it's neat having, we're at Safeway and, and there's there's five year olds wearing a Verdura construction hat, you know, and it's uh, it's just, I, I get a kick out of it. But I've been sponsoring everything for as long as I can remember. I just they call me up. I sponsor. Done deal. <laughs> well, well, they always say that uh, generosity precedes prosperity. Right. And so it's that same methodology that you have, Jamie, is that. You know, that generous giving back, especially locally, I think that's amazing advice. You're the first guest, I've been doing this three years now, that has spoken about just the value of donating locally, right, to these local organizations. And and I've seen the yeah. benefit, you know, my I had a couple of daughters that were in cheer. Yeah, we donate to cheer. And so, you know, when they get their shirts for cheer camp for this younger generation, and some of my kids will be like, hey, I saw someone at the store and they had like a cheer shirt. It had AFT's logo on there. And then awesome. my, my juniors in high school, she's in musical theater. Yeah, and we have like in their, uh, in the playbill, right? Because she's in musical theater. So AFT has a page in there, you know, sponsoring the, you know, the yeah. musical theater. And it's been really valuable, just people. Because if you're involved in the community, they know you care. It's the, it's, it's the biggest thing. It's our biggest strength. And it, and it, and it helps you grow. Just being around, being, uh, Instagram is another big one, right? But being local is huge. You know, and it helps having a bunch of guys with your shirt on, right? You got 30 guys running around town with your shirt on. So Verdura is just kind of everywhere in town. But sponsoring is huge. We do a Night of Lights parade down. We have a nice Main Street, and we live in a small town. It looks like small town USA right? on Half Moon Bay, right? Small coastal town. There's a Night of Lights parade. Of course, we build a big old float, and we do it. And we were in the Halloween parade. We, get in the, we dress up in monsters, and we drive the old school car down the road. I mean, we're just involved. <laughs> Being involved. Is, and, and, and I'll do it to get the wife. Do it because it's fun. It's it's fun being part of a small town. You know, and actually coming up, it took me a while to get T-shirts. I mean, I was in you know, my late 20s there, and I was like just starting to kind of grow and, and, and become a company, starting to get some employees. And uh, I remember being, like, nervous. And I knew that once I put my name on my shirt, that's it. You are now that guy in town. So you either you either make it or you fail. And I just knew back then, I remember like, all right, man, it's time. It's time to start putting your name on your stuff, trucks, shirts, sponsoring. And, you know, that's made a decision in my late 20s. And, you know, fast forward, you know, 43 now. And love it, man. Love having my name all over town. 
Well, it's interesting. I mean, I know a big thing just, uh, you know, not specific to the conversation today, but having known you and know kind of your product on social media, I mean, you're always big on like family first and like your teams, your family, your company, and really your community. And you kind of live that. I mean, anyone that's listened to the hour of this episode already knows like your commitment to your family your, and, and you look at your employees as family and the community. And I'm sure that just culturally and the success of your company can be, you know, it can go to just, you know, that upbringing. I mean, that mentality you have. Yeah, no, and, and that's it. And um, you can't, like we covered, we covered a little bit earlier, being an island, buck stops here and kind of getting burned out. How do you manage that? I mean, really, how do you get pulled through the fire is your team. It's your, it's your family. It's it's guys who you're, they lift you up when you're down. And um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, family first, team becomes family. Um, I posted that post. Um, we had an emotional conversation with one of my guys. Um, I don't get too specific, but something was happening with him personally. And I just got off the phone call with him and I was like, man, you know, and I, it, it just, that sucks. And I'm, you know, he's asking me for advice. I'm telling him I got your back. And it, it, it family is first. This job's always going to be here. The work's always going to be here tomorrow, but your team is your family and, and you need them to get through the hard times. And that's where that post came from. Cause I just had a really rough conversation with one of my guys. And I was just like, man, this guy's on my team. He's a team leader. But you know what? What's more important right now for him and for us is his family. And I support that a thousand percent, you know, I actually bend over backwards to do anything for him. So, yeah, um, for me to do ex- to, for me to do what I'm doing right now, team and family or else there's just no over construction. It just doesn't work. So have you had any mentors that you could look back in your career, maybe early on or even, you know, that have had an impact on you? Yeah, I mean, I had, you know, my first guys that got me in the trades, um, kind of taught me the trades. You know, I learned that, you know, all we do is self-reform. <laughs> but uh, I've had some partners uh, through the years, <laughs> but I've kind of, <laughs> but I've kind of, I've kind of outgrown them. Um, you know, they still, they're still small, real, I mean, not small, I mean, just a couple guys are by themselves or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't really have, I mean, last 10 years, not, not, not really a mentor. Kind of, kind of am the mentor for a lot of guys. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of phones I can call them. Yeah. I'm, there's not a lot of phones I can call and be like, Hey, you know, unless they're a peer, like I, I could call you and ask you somehow you handle something, you know, but I don't have anybody that I can just call and kind of talk to about some things. If I can't figure it out, it's kind of, gets a little, that's a little tricky sometimes. Yeah. So what do you do for fun? I mean, being a mentor, you know, the boss of your company, everything you have going on. I mean, what's your outlet being as busy as you are? Uh, you know what? I don't, I, you know, I just, I'm not a big hobby guy. I try, man. I got a surfboard. I don't use, I got a hunting rifle. I don't use, I got a, you know, things like that, but uh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. How, hold on, Jamie, you have a surfboard. It's way too cold, man. How I can't even like barely swim in the Pacific in Southern California, man. Half the bay. <laughs> Yeah, and there's sharks, man, and there's sharks. So that's why I said I don't, I don't use it, man. Yeah, um, yeah. Outlet wise, I mean, to be honest with you, you know, I love just doing. I mean, it's terrible. It sounds terrible, but I just love being for the construction. It's a big one, and right now, so Half Moon Bay is a pumpkin, you know, pumpkin festival. It's a pumpkin capital of California, so it's a big Halloween town. And I've already, we've already been out every night, and we do. I build a haunted house. We dress up, man. We scare kids. We have it's just outlets like that. Like we get into the holidays. Um, and I do, I do more stuff like that with the kids and I, I mean, I'm a big kid, so I, I like that, you know, I'll go out and cruise the old, the old muscle car around for an hour here and there. That's, that's a good time. But other than that, man, nothing, nothing too, nothing too crazy for me. So two questions then what, what's your Halloween costume this year and what's the muscle car you drive? <laughs> so dude, well, it's kind of lame. I'm, I'm Jay. I'm always Jason. All right. I make a good Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I drive I drive a uh, 650 horsepower 1963 Ford Fairlane, so that's a it's a fun car. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Do you have any other cars or just uh just a Ford? No, just that, uh, just just a Ford and a bunch of trucks, man. That's it. Yeah, t- I, we we got a lot of company trucks too, man. That keeps me busy. So maybe one day I'll get into the cars and have some more time. But um, you know, what do you have that's upcoming and exciting? uh big big stuff on the horizon for us is kind of more of a personal thing i think we're gonna be breaking ground on our personal home uh in the spring which has been a long a long battle as you know california trying to get things permitted and 
you know, all that good stuff. But I think it's finally going to happen, which will, uh, you know, make the kids happy because they're, I think they're itching to kind of get that thing going. But yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. You know, that, that and grinding it out, man. Well, I wouldn't say that's pretty much it. That's a big deal. So is this the first house you built for yourself? Uh, no, no. I built uh, I built the first house for myself in 2008. Um, that was the first one I did. But um, this one, this is a nice one. We we made a decision. We made a move. It's a little it's a little out of town. It's kind of more of a country, you know, a little bit of bigger spot and a little more land. And um, so, yeah, we're gonna go try out try some country living. We'll see how that goes. That's amazing. How far out of town are you gonna be? Uh, it's just about 15 minutes south of where we are now, so not not too bad. Just down the coast a little ways. Yeah, a little more commute time. That's You'll good, have yeah. more time to make some phone calls now, right? <laughs> yeah, more office time, right? So where can our listeners find you? Uh, the, big, the big one's Instagram. Big big one's Instagram. It's Verdur Construction. You know, if you've got any questions, DM me. I answer all my DMs. Even if I don't know you, I will I will respond to you. So um, that's the best way. Um, that's the easiest. Right? That's what I would do. You get a hold of me, DM me. I love it, Jamie. You've been amazing. Again, I, it's grateful to call you a friend. You have an amazing business. The fact that um, I look at this, you know, with what I have on my plate and I'm like, Jamie, that he's doing these complicated projects. He's building in California. He's self-performing. Like, honestly, I don't know how you do it. Like, even after listening to you on this episode, I'm like, I don't know how he manages everything. It's just impressive. So uh, just cheers to you, man. It's really cool what you've, what you've accomplished. Yeah, thanks, brother. I appreciate that, man. I'm proud to call you as friend as well, man. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, get to KBiz and iBiz. So for those listening, I told Jamie before we got on air today, uh, so I have 17 employees, so there's 17 of us. So my five office staff are going to stay behind, but my 12 field staff, including two of my project coordinators, Sue and Megan, they're going to come. So we're going to have 12 of us representing AFT in Vegas. So for anyone coming, and hopefully you're there, Jamie, you'll see uh, a whole crowd of us there. Absolutely. Looking forward to it, man. Okay. We'll see you, Jamie. Cool. Thanks, Brad. See you. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, they're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.